All right, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Lauren Frickle. I lead the marketing team here at Synergistic and want to welcome you to our first monthly cyber briefing. So before we begin, I'd like to quickly go over a bit of housekeeping. There are a few buttons on the left side of your screen that we'll use today. Please use the chat button to engage in conversation with the entire group. For example, if you see a colleague or peer in the audience with you, feel free to see, say hi there in that chat function. And please use the Q&A button right below the chat button to ask your questions. Mac has planned to pause throughout this presentation to address questions that I will moderate for him. As a heads up, this session is being recorded and will be available to stream here in this inventory platform by the end of the day. We have dropped a link to the cyber briefing lobby in the chat so you can bookmark it to easily access past and future cyber briefing sessions. So before I turn the mic over, I ask that our audience remain muted. Keep your cameras off until we get to a Q&A segment. During a Q&A segment, feel free if you'd like to engage on camera and on mic. Now, let's start today's session. Mac, I will turn the mic over to you and you are unmuted. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome everybody to our, our session today. And I think everybody knows who I am, so we'll skip that point. And uh, um, before I get started, I'd like to, to, to mention a couple of things. Uh, those of you who have, who have um, experienced uh, Synergistic's educational uh, activities in the past and are familiar with us as a customer, perhaps, uh, know that uh, we, in the past, before COVID, used to provide uh, multiple learning opportunities for folks around the country uh, in in in-person events and uh, we hope to get back to those uh, fairly soon uh, because frankly I've always enjoyed being able to be in the room uh, with people and being able to engage directly and and uh, and I find that oftentimes it, it becomes more interactive uh, that way uh, and I but I hope that that, that that we can make these interactive as well. And of course, that'll, that'll depend a lot on, on all of you. Um, but I encourage you to, uh, to ask questions uh, and, to, and to engage uh, with me uh, and, and with each other for that matter. Um, the other thing that, that I'd like to mention is you also may know that Synergistic uh, uh, used to put on its, its own annual event, which was designed just for our customers. Uh, and, and unlike a lot of other networking events, we don't have uh, vendors or other uh, folks uh, at that event. It is literally our staff um, and our customers um, that that meet. And the last one of those that we were able to have, of course, was in uh, 2019. Um, but we intend to have have one this year. Uh, it's going to be at the end of May. Uh, it's going to be in Austin uh, as well, uh, where the, where our last one was. Uh, the difference is this time it's going to be at uh, Texas State uh, University. Uh, Texas State has been gracious enough to uh, to offer to host that event, um, and uh, and I hope all of you will take a look at look at that and the invitation. Uh, it's a great opportunity for you to come and uh, rub elbows with your peers uh, in the industry uh, and and our staff uh, directly and talk about uh, the things that uh, are important to all of us from a privacy and security uh, perspective uh, and to get to hear uh, the, the, the analysis of, 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 of all of our efforts throughout the year where we take a look at all the assessments that we perform across the year, all the tests that we perform, uh, all of the vendor security uh, assessments that we do, uh, et cetera, uh, and the privacy monitoring and basically share with you the trends that we see in all of that, some of which I'll talk about today a little bit. Um, but that's an opportunity for us to give back to you uh, and to share with you uh, what we learn in working with all of you and, 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 all, and also uh, uh, have the opportunity for great interaction between, between the audience um, 
and the folks that uh, present the information there. So I hope you'll look for that invitation and I hope uh, we see a lot of you there. Last time we did this, we had over a hundred folks um, and it was just a great lively uh, discussion. Uh, and we literally had two days uh, just full of, of uh, uh, networking and, 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 and in-depth discussion around, around cyber and, and privacy and, and uh, uh, other topics that were, were important to the folks that were there. So with that, I'd like to get started today. Um, I think everybody here uh, knows this gentleman, you, and you may or may or may not have seen uh, this quote uh, by him. This is actually, I went to, I was very fortunate in my government career to be sent to Harvard to the Kennedy School uh, for Government. And when you walked in, uh, there was a picture of this gentleman, obviously, <laughs> uh, the namesake. Um, and this quote uh, is up in, in the lobby uh, when you walk in. And I think it's absolutely true. And I think it's incredi incredibly uh, relevant as it relates to cybersecurity. I mean, I've been doing this for 40 plus years uh, and I still on a daily basis learn. And I, and I get up every morning, I read a lot of information to try to, try to stay up on what's going on. Uh, in our in, uh, environment uh, and, and with this subject um, and uh, and I never I never have a week go by that I don't learn something new uh, because of the dynamic nature of, of cybersecurity and privacy and and uh, the things that we do and I and so I, I, I this is to me education has always been a really important part of what we do um, and it's a really uh, important part of of how we share uh, with one another and, and help each other uh, learn. So with that, I'm going to go into our, you know, this, I, the way I laid this out for everybody, just for your knowledge, uh, because one of the things I wanted to do was set this up so that it was something that we could provide uh, on a monthly basis and update uh, with respect to information. So to, to make sure that it, that the content is always refreshed. Um, but there, and I want it to be both um, uh, uh, topical um, as well as as educational, um, and so it's broken into sec sections. And as I go through it, we'll we'll have a, 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 a I'll present some information, um, and please be thinking about questions. And we'll pause at the end of each section and 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 ask uh, if there are questions, um, and and address those before we move on. Uh, to the next. Um, and I think the first section that I wanted to cover or topic I wanted to talk about today is, is this topic of healthcare as a critical uh, infrastructure. And I've been doing a lot of speaking on this and a lot of interviewing uh, with respect to this because there's a lot of folks up, up that are very interested in it. Uh, some of the universities that I, that I uh, provide instruction at uh, recently have asked me to talk about this topic. Uh, when I was in the government, I had the opportunity as the director of security for one of the defense agencies to sit on what's called the critical Infra uh, critical infrastructure protection board, uh, which is all of the directors of security across uh, the Department of Defense uh, who take a look and the interagency who take a look at uh, the critical infrastructures that we have uh, in this country. And healthcare and public health is absolutely one of those 16 uh, critical infrastructures. What's interesting about the critical infrastructures and that, and that a lot of people don't, don't think about it at, at, at in face value is that these are not just separate um, uh, uh, slices of the, of the pie, if you will. Uh, all of these are actually very much uh, integrated with one another, meaning what happens in, in term when with communications, if it somehow impact, it affects all the others. It affects us in healthcare. Um, even the, the defense industrial base, you may not uh, may not know the connection or see the connection between healthcare and the and the defense industrial base, but very it is very much there because there are a lot of healthcare organizations that actually do research or provide services to the DOD. Um, and, and are part of what's called the defense industrial base. And so when those healthcare entities are impacted in some way, it affects, uh, it affects defense. Uh, emergency services, energy, if energy is disrupted, obviously it can disrupt any, any one of the other uh, critical infrastructures, et cetera. 
Um, so all of these, in one way or another, are connected to one another. Uh, but they, but and together, they represent the things that that create the foundation of what allows us to have continuity of government and continuity of of our country uh, in the time in times of of uh, some kind of uh, adverse uh, uh, event. Um, and healthcare and public health is getting a lot of attention now, uh, especially in the cyber world, as it relates to its being a critical infrastructure. You know, they talk about the threats and hazards to the critical infrastructures, and, and you'll notice that I, I, I highlighted some of these, and some of these I'm going to use as examples as I, as I talk about things uh, uh, in a minute. Um, but every single one of these, in one way or another, can absolutely affect affect healthcare or a healthcare institution. Um, and some of these you know full well. I mean, you know better than, than me or a lot of other people, things like the pandemics that you see there, unscheduled disruptions, uh, supply chain attacks, uh, et cetera. Um, but every single one of these threats or hazards we've actually seen in one incident or another uh, in terms of affecting healthcare. Um, so we really pretty much are, very, uh, are not pretty much, are very much are a part of the, the critical infrastructure uh, of this country and, is, and, and therefore incredibly important. Um, and we face the same hazards, uh, if you will, and threats that pretty much every other critical infrastructure faces. You know, we talk about cyber as a risk factor from this perspective. You know, you think about it, most everything we do in healthcare today uh, that it is automated or, or the data or the information related to that process or that function uh, is automated is in some kind of an application or is in some database or is in some uh, automated uh, process or service uh, that we see. And as a result, um, that data and those services and those systems or solutions uh, become incredibly critical to our ability to, to accomplish our mission which is where the whole impact from cyber and, and us as a critical infrastructure um, uh, comes together. Um, also, our attack surface is growing uh, exponentially, uh, and, and it grew even more exponentially during the pandemic with a lot of our workforce um, uh, leaving our institutions and going out and working remotely. Um, and we already had a lot of a lot of services and, and solutions uh, that were provided uh, by by third party vendors or supply chain vendors. Uh, so much so that 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 before the pandemic, we were averaging somewhere around 30 percent of our IT environment existed outside the four walls of our of our institutions. And today, it's 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 beyond 40 percent actually in terms of 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 how much is done uh, outside as opposed to inside uh, our own our own uh, data centers and our own hospitals. Um, but at the same time that our attack surface has grown exponentially and the threat has grown exponentially, which we're going to talk about in the next section, we're still not spending the amount of money uh, or resources or on cybersecurity that most of our counterparts are uh, in other uh, regulated or critical infrastructures. Um, we're, we're anywhere from three to five percent of our IT budget, which is which is less than half or a third of what a lot of those other industries are spending on cybersecurity. And unfortunately, uh, the bad guys uh, actually know that. Um, and and they they because they can read all of the all of the studies and the surveys and, and the reports and articles that are published just, just like we can. And so they know which industries are spending money on security uh, and, and, and keeping up or falling behind and which ones aren't. Um, we're also suffering from, from IT personnel shortages. Many, many CIOs that I talked to uh, today say that they have anywhere from 30 to 40% of their IT positions vacant. Many of the, the the security organizations are finding it very difficult to hold on uh, to their talent, primarily because a lot of other uh, companies, technical companies, and the government, et cetera, are willing to pay those folks a lot more uh, or pay them more to attract them to leave uh, and to go elsewhere. And so it's it's very difficult. I mean, even 
I mean, I think that the average turnover in uh, cybersecurity today in most organizations, uh, to include the tech companies like ours that, that are predominantly those people, is anywhere from 30 to 40 percent, which is a pretty high, pretty high number. And, and so it's very difficult to for organizations to, to build any kind of uh, continuity um, or consistency with respect to their organization when, when that many people are, are floating in and out. Um, and I've actually had folks tell me recently that, that they lost uh, their entire uh, um, IT security team uh, to a vendor, uh, which, is, you know, which is a you know, tremendous loss uh, when something like that happens. Um, you know, one of the things we, <clears throat> we see with respect to all the, the, the assessments that we do across the country is that we still have less than half of our healthcare entities that are actively monitoring their environment, meaning they have a, a SIM and a SOC and, and active people looking at a pane of glass, uh, monitoring what's going on in terms of all of the, all of the network traffic and the external traffic and et cetera, that's coming at them from a threat perspective and, and providing alerts. Um, and in today's environment where we literally have hundreds of thousands or if not millions of events uh, that occur every day that are, uh, that are a threat, um, that's a real disconcerting uh, uh, fact that we have that much of our environment uh, that's so dependent on IT uh, that's still not monitored in an active fashion. Um, we already talked about the attack surface, which is, which is growing uh, exponentially. Um, we still are operating a lot of unsupported software and unsupported systems. Uh, that's primarily due to a lot of legacy applications that we have out there and devices uh, that are in our environment that are uh, built on, on uh, unsupported uh, operating systems, et cetera. And all of that just contributes to uh, us being a bigger risk or having a bigger risk profile, if you will, um, than, we, than we would probably want to have. Um, and less than a fourth of our healthcare entities run what we call immersive IR exercises, meaning something beyond a tabletop that actually exercises the plan and puts people in a situation where they have to actively problem solve uh, to respond to a scenario uh, or a simulated uh, event, if you will. And so all of this kind of adds up to, the, to, to this notion that, that uh, healthcare absolutely has a, a fairly high cyber risk profile. Um, one of the things I thought I would talk about today, because you probably have all seen it, um, is the uh, uh, FY 2022 omnibus funding bill, uh, which, which contains the conference agreement with respect to the Cybersecurity Incident Reporting Act. Um, you know, this is something that's going to change the landscape uh, with respect to reporting for just about everybody. Um, uh, it also puts another organization, which is CISA, in front of this um, and basically says that organizations who experience a cyber attack uh, have 72 hours to report it to CISA. And if they make a ransomware payment, which we know anywhere from 64 to 72%, what, give or take a few points here or there, it's, as it gets reported, are indeed making ransomware and payments, uh, are going to have to report that uh, within 24 hours uh, to CISA. Um, and that in and of itself can put some organizations at risk because if you don't truly understand who you can and can't make a ransomware payment to with respect to who's on the government's list of in entities or organizations that you cannot make payments to, um, that could potentially create some legal uh, issues uh, for organizations. Um, but this basically, it, it goes even further that says that the civilian agencies will also have to report all cyber attacks uh, to CISA and notify Congress. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of, of uh, visibility into what's going on. And there are many organizations, unlike those of us who work primarily in healthcare, who've had to, who have had a breach reporting or, a, or a, an event reporting requirement 
uh, for several years now, this is going to put everybody else uh, in, in, a, in a similar boat, but a little bit differently because this is not just a breach or in terms of information, but this is actually, actually notifying that an event occurred, regardless of whether there was, whether there was breach of information or not. Um, the good news is, is we're probably uh, several years away from this act, act actually uh, becoming active because DHS has to uh, perform uh, the rulemaking with respect to this new requirement. Um, and that will take a while for one, for them to, to uh, draft those rules and then put out the NPRM, which will, which has to be out there for X number of months and then and then comment period and then et cetera, et cetera. So chances are, unless somebody expedites that in some manner, um, we won't see the final uh, enforcement of this rule uh, for anywhere from three to four years from now. But I say that only because that's kind of the, the, the current um, time frame that we see with these kinds of things, but it could get it accelerated and, and actually be quicker. So it's going to really create kind of a unique scenario for folks in that, in that you're going to have to notify that you had an incident within 72 hours. You may not have to notify individuals for 60 days under HIPAA, but that information is already going to be out there um, in some fashion. This also is going to affect organizations like my own because we're a public company and I'm a public, uh, public CEO. And uh, one of the things that the SEC has been, has been hot on for quite a while now is stepping up the, the uh, responsibility and accountability for cybersecurity and publicly traded entities. Um, and so most uh, all public companies have to have a dedicated CISO. That individual has to report to the CEO as well as to the uh, board of that public company. Um, and there are very uh, definite re requirements for uh, uh, board members as well, which you can see here. Um, and a lot of a lot of non-public companies are actually adopting these because they think because they're best practice. Um, but what's interesting is the SEC has already gotten on board with this new requirement uh, for for a notification as well and said this this is something that they feel applies to all uh, public entities so this is really going to affect a lot of organizations um, in terms of visibility into what's going on and how often are organizations actually getting hit with some form of, of cyber event and the whole reason for this is quite frankly about is all about disruption uh, and when you think about critical infrastructure, that's what we're concerned about. We're concerned about disruption, meaning the inability of an organization or a critical infrastructure to perform whatever its core mission is. And for healthcare, obviously, that's providing care and, and, and taking care of people. Uh, and when you look at the stats uh, just from 2020 alone, and we're going to talk about many more of these uh, later, you know, uh, ransomware is an example or disruptive attacks, if you will, um, have become a huge issue uh, for our industry. It is costing us a tremendous amount of, of resource, uh, if you will, or treasure in terms of, of dollars for our, our, our institutions. But more importantly, it is now beginning to impact the quality of patient care and as well as patient safety because we've seen from studies done of organizations that were hit with long-term disruptive attacks that uh, thing, things like um, outcomes have been affected as well as mortality rates uh, have increased. Um, and that is very, very troubling for the folks who are watching this industry as a, as a critical infrastructure and what that portends for the future if cyber uh, cr criminal activity and cyber attacks continue and just get worse. So basically, you know, the, the last thing that I want to talk about uh, here is, is um, the uh, conflict that we all know is ongoing uh, over in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and, you know, I know probably everybody saw that that uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, the president 
uh, came out and warned everybody that Russia may be exploring cyber attacks against the U.S. Uh, in a more uh, active fashion. Um, healthcare uh, was not specifically mentioned, uh, but it, they said it, all, all sectors uh, should uh, prepare. And then CISA and the FBI came out right afterwards and, and published uh, their own uh, advisories. Um, and the bottom line is everybody should just be vigilant right now. There's no telling uh, what could or could not happen. Um, but certainly um, any attack against any of our infrastructures here in the United States, whether it be transportation, fuel, energy, et cetera, uh, could have a, a downstream effect for all of us to include healthcare, uh, even if we're not attacked uh, directly. So what I've listed here, and if you haven't seen this, or if you didn't see this, um, you know, that there are places that you can report activity if you begin to see uh, suspicious cyber activity on your network uh, emanating from Eastern Europe. Uh, or you can go to uh, the Shield the CISA website itself and go to the Shields Up campaign to see and, and to look at the guidance there with respect to what they recommend. Um, and you can, if you're not getting these warnings or these alerts, then you should probably be asking, asking, uh, how you can get them um, and uh, to make sure that you can stay abreast. So what can you do and what do they, what, what are some of the things that are recommended? Well, you can conduct what we call environmental scans, understanding your weaknesses. And this can be things like doing vulnerability tests right now to understand where you may be uh, lacking in, in patching. This can be doing digital uh, forensics in terms of understanding what you look like on in the dark web and, and what the, attackers are likely to know about you and your organization or key personnel that they could pot potentially use against you. Um, you can begin to look at uh, any of your public facing vulnerabilities in terms of web applications, et cetera, making sure that you're patching those and applying uh, multi-factor authentication so that, that, that if somebody just compromises somebody's credentials, they, they still can't get in. Uh, making sure that you're securing those credentials more effectively, uh, deploying multi-factor authentication on all of your mail accounts if you haven't already done that, or deploying multi-factor on all of your web-enabled uh, applications, et cetera, um, making sure, or implementing what's called a, a PAM or a Privileged Access Management Solution, which is also sometimes referred to as a vault, where we basically take accelerated uh, privileges, if you will, and and, uh, and essentially eliminate them uh, so that they're not persistent in the environment and so that those individuals who need the, that kind of elevated uh, privilege, if you will, to work on things has to go and check those things out. They're only there for a certain period of time. They're monitored while they're out. Uh, and it just, and all of this is designed to make it harder for that attacker uh, to get in and to actually conduct reconnaissance and, and, and then exploit the organization. Um, making sure that we're looking at our operating systems and our industrial control system type things. Uh, if we're seeing things like unexpected behaviors, reporting those, reporting anomalous activity, and there's, and there's the, the report at CISA.gov or the phone number that you can, um, that you can do that. Um, you know, determine if or when you've been compromised. Conduct a compromise assessment. Um, oftentimes, compromise assessments are not done until we've actually been compromised because we're looking to see what happened and how the bad guy got in. There's nothing that says you can't do a compromise assessment proactively and identify one, whether you've been compromised and didn't know it, or two, where you are likely to be compromised and then be able to proactively uh, anticipate that and, and, and address it so that you eliminate that risk. You know, know your network and your connectivity to Russia and other surrounding territories, meaning, you know, have you actually limited traffic that's coming from that part of the world? Uh, if you have to have, if you have to communicate with somebody over there, perhaps whitelisting that address as opposed to allowing that whole uh, country designator to have access to your network. Exercising your IR plan, making sure that it's current, making sure you know where it is, making sure that it's up to date with respect to 
uh, all of the individuals that need to be involved, make sure you have all of the, the uh, contact information you need for law enforcement and for cyber insurance, et cetera. Um, so, that you, so that if something happens, you're ready um, uh, to respond. And then monitor your network and share suspicious activity uh, with CISA and others. Uh, but unfortunately, as we talked about in one of the slides previously, um, we have a lot of networks that, that unfortunately are not being monitored actively. And that that's, puts those, those, in, those organizations at greater risk as a result of that. Um, and then last but not least, engage with legal cyber insurance uh, and your legal counsel. Make sure that, make sure that they're geared up and ready to go uh, should something unforeseen or un unfortunate occur. So let me start, stop there and uh, see if there's any questions on, on the topic of healthcare as a critical infrastructure or any of the things I talked about. Lauren, would you like to do that? Yep, no questions yet, Mac. Um, for those of you in the audience, you can upload your questions if you hit that little hand button and type your question. I'll monitor it here for a few minutes. Okay. And don't worry if you if you don't have a or haven't thought of a question uh, yet or right now um, uh, or if you think about it later, you can always submit it um, and we will uh, um, get you an answer uh, and we will try to get the question and the answer out to, to all the attendees so that you, ha you have the benefit of seeing seeing that as well. So Lauren, any questions? Not at this time, Mac. Okay, well then let's move on. Let's go into the threat overview. And I thought what we would do here is we would talk about what the current threat is uh, that we're seeing in healthcare um, and how that potentially is making our lives uh, a little more difficult. So uh, many of you might know that I'm a retired Marine. Um, and um, this individual is probably one of the most revered uh, commanders in the Marine Corps. He, he retired as a Lieutenant General. Uh, we, we affectionately refer to him as Chesty. Uh, when when uh, General Puller was a Colonel, it, as you see here in this picture, he was in command of the Marine Regiment that was surrounded at the Chosen Reservoir in the Korean conflict. Uh, he was actually surrounded by five uh, Chinese divisions. Um, and uh, when the two-star army general uh, who was in command of operations in that theater reached out to him and said, Colonel Puller, what, what do you want to do? Uh, Colonel Puller was alleged to say, you know, we've been looking for the bad guys all day. We finally found him. He's all around us. And now we, you know, that makes things a lot simpler. We know what we need to do. And what Colonel Puller did which was uncharacteristic, um, but was the right thing to do, was he didn't, he didn't sit there and put his Marines in a defensive posture and wait for the divisions, the, the, the Chinese divisions to come at him. Because if he'd done that nine times out of 10, they probably would have wiped out that entire Marine, Marine regiment. Um, but instead, Colonel Fuller knew that the, that the best defense was an offense. And instead of waiting, waiting to sit there and be attacked, he said, you know what, we're going to, we're going to attack. And so he turned in one direction and he attacked and he wiped out two of those Chinese divisions as he came out of the chosen reservoir and saved the majority of his Marines um, and got himself out of that situation. And I use this analogy today for us in cybersecurity when we think about the threat, because we are literally in the chosen reservoir. Um, we are surrounded by cyber criminals, by nation state actors, by hacktivists, by all manner of, of cyber uh, organ people and organizations that, that, that are intent on doing us harm. Um, and when you look at the number of, of attempts that, that organizations see on a daily basis. I talked to one CEO later, lately that said they had begun counting the number of ransomware attempts 
that they see daily uh, since the pandemic started and it ex escalated and they see upwards of over 400 a day. Um, the point is, is that they are literally coming at us from all directions. And it's my opinion that sitting, sitting there in a defensive posture uh, in, a, in a very reactive mode as we have been in the past is really not where we need to be today. We really need to take, take the fight back, back to the adversary. We need to become more proactive in our security. We need to become more offensive in our security. We need to actually build better resilience into our security programs and our protections uh, so that we can better anticipate where the threat is going to come at us uh, and respond to that in a much more effective way to make our protections more effective as well as our response uh, when something uh, unfortunate uh, occurs. And so, you know, the analogy here is the Marines could have sat there and waited for the, for the to be attacked and, and wiped out, but they chose instead to take the battle to the, to the enemy and control the, the battle as opposed to being the, the victim of the battle. And as I said, these guys, these are the guys that are coming at us. We've got criminals, we've got nation state actors. We unfortunately have unscrupulous partners. We have insiders who make mistakes uh, and, and or sometimes do things that they shouldn't. And we have activists, activists that are out there. And, you know, all of us, we, we all know the, the activist group Anonymous. Um, and uh, we all know that Anonymous has gotten in the act with respect to the Ukraine uh, conflict and has, and has gone after uh, Russia, um, which, <laughs> which uh, there's a part of me that, that you, you got to kind of, kind of, sort of um, say, you know what, <laughs> I guess sometimes uh, there's, a, there's a good side to everybody. Um, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that th this is out there and it's active and it's, and it's, you know, they're, they're, they're there to steal our, our money. They're there to steal our data. They're there to extort. They're there to steal information for some, some purpose. Um, sometimes it's just there to be disruptive or to be destructive. Um, and, and, uh, and it just, and it just, the fact of the matter is, is that in healthcare today, we see all of it um, in, in every variety. You know, when you look at the, the you know records number of records and i'm going to say something probably is that won't be very popular and that is that you know we've been we've been monitoring the number of leaks or events that have occurred that have allowed healthcare information to to escape uh our control um it has gone it has done nothing but go up uh year over year um and and frankly, when I look at this, I'm like, I don't know whether it's just because it's just not possible to stop or it's just not important enough for us uh, to stop it. Uh, but I will tell you this, and that is that I truly believe that that if I had to pick the thing that I would focus on the most, even though I don't like this trend and I don't like uh, what we're seeing here, and and, I, and obviously I would like for us to to have fewer breaches of, of information. I am far more concerned about the disruptive attacks that interrupt operations and interrupt care uh, or put care at risk uh, than I am uh, actual data. And that's what gets us to this slide, which is if you look at this graph, it basically shows how, the, how we have tracked uh, the number the number of breaches that have, that have involved hacking, if you will, uh, since 2005. Um, and, and you notice that from 2013, as it relates to ransomware um, in particular, um, that graph took off exponentially in terms of numbers. And now it's kind of leveled out again, but it's still very much, very, very uh, much more higher than it was uh, when we began. And when you look at the, the, the two little boxes down below and you realize that, that um, ransomware is the cause of 50% of our healthcare breaches. Um, 
and that we see 4,000 ransomware attacks a day um, in, in our country. Um, this is a significant problem, which I know everybody understands. Um, and it took the reason it took off after 2013 uh, was because the, the attackers finally had a way of anonymously getting paid because uh, cryptocurrency came on the market in 2013. And, and now they could get, they can actually not only conduct their attacks and they had advanced encryption uh, capabilities uh, available to them and, and different attack methods, uh, but they had the ability to get paid in a way that couldn't be traced. Uh, which is exactly why ransomware attacks took off. Um, and it's, and then because it's all about the money. Um, you know, when you look at the, the cyber attacks that organizations have across the country, and it's not just, not just healthcare, um, but the, the two thirds of them are all about money. They're all about extorting uh, individuals or companies uh, for money. And what's interesting is that a lot of those extortion attempts today, or those ransoms, if you will, are going up exponentially. They're not thousands of dollars uh, like they used to be. They're millions of dollars. Um, and later you're going to see me talk about a couple of examples um, uh, that were literally tens of millions of dollars. So, you know, who's coming at us? Well, on any given day, the, the people that uh, track threats, uh, do threat hunting, uh, keep track of the number of, of individual uh, threat actors out there that they are able to identify. And right now there are roughly somewhere around 250 different threat actors that we're seeing active in, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem. And about 195 of those are actually targeting the United States. And then when you break that 195 down in terms of which ones of them are focusing, which, focusing on which industries, you notice in terms of our industry that at least 83 of those 195 are focused on healthcare. But, but what's important here to think about or to understand or realize is that you have 80 three dedicated cyber criminal organizations that are focused on stealing information or disrupting our industry. And that's significant because they get up every day and that's what their job is. That's what they do. Just like you get up every day and deliver IT services or security or, or healthcare, these guys get up every day and try to figure out how to disrupt that. Right, and where do those eighty? Where are those eighty-three actors located? Well, we know that the largest majority of them are located in Eastern Europe, China, and Russia. Uh, and then there are others that we frankly don't know where they're located. <laughs> they could be located here. They could be located down in South America. Some of them may be also located uh, in Eastern Europe and or China and Russia. Um, but overwhelmingly a lot of these groups uh, that are out there uh, are located in the very part of the world that right now is involved in in conflict which raises everybody's sense of concern if you will um, for what that means for all the rest of us when you look at the 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 threat intelligence reports with respect to who are the most targeted the United States, by far, is the most targeted nation on the planet. We constitute 84% of the victims of cyber, cyber incidents. Uh, but what's interesting is that healthcare actually represents 55% of those victims, which means our industry is literally the most attacked industry, bar none, or at least the, the, the industry that has the highest number of victims of cybercrime um, on an annual basis of anybody else in, in any other uh, country or industry in the world. Eight out of 10 of the most active threat actors um, target uh, the US healthcare industry. Two of the most prevalent 
uh, vehicles for delivering ransomware, Emotet and TrickBot uh, are in that top 10 list. Um, and both of those uh, families we see uh, consistently being used against our industry. 1012, this was an, this was an alert that came out from, from HHS uh, cybersecurity program. Uh, 1012 is another uh, threat organization uh, that um, is also known to, to focus on or, or, or target uh, healthcare. You can see there they use TrickBot and Imitad. They also use Cobalt Strike as, a, as an attack uh, vehicle, if you will. They're, they're, they're focused on, on ransomware and extortion. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, is as you see here, is that those ransom demands uh, have ranged in the millions, as opposed to uh, in in the thousands. Part of uh, our analysis in doing uh, risk analysis is is an analysis of the threat in terms of the threat's capability to carry out an attack and their motivation and et cetera. When you look at the cyber threat that is focused on healthcare you instantly re recognize based on all the evidence that they are they are incredibly capable they are absolutely intent on disrupting or 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 uh, uh, damaging uh, our industry they absolutely target our institutions um, what they do is is relevant uh, to um, uh, our organizations and, and last but not least, they are, it, it, there is an extremely high likelihood um, that we're going to have an event. And, and, the, and, the, and the statistics all bear that out. Over 90% of our healthcare organizations have had cyber attacks. Over 50% of them have had, had ransomware, successful ransomware attacks. Um, they have multiple attacks uh, on an annual basis. Um, there is no doubt whatsoever that there is a highly motivated, highly capable, um, uh, high, highly dedicated threat uh, against uh, healthcare, which is one reason why it begs the question, why, why aren't we spending more and why aren't we focused on becoming better prepared to handle that threat? Um, you know, this is an interesting graph that I throw through in here because it, it talks about the different types of ransomware families. And it says that uh, at any given time, um, the folks that do threat hunting and threat analysis have identified that at any given time, a hundred or more uh, families, ransomware families are active in the environment. Um, and when you look at the, the um, graph at the bottom, you'll notice that the date there is, it goes from January 2020 to September of last year, which is the height of the pandemic. Um, and of course, the height of the pandemic was in 2020. And you notice that the number of active ransomware families or the number the activity of those ransomware families was the highest when we were all going through the pandemic which meant when our organizations were at their highest level of stress with beds full people overworked etc um and, and and people dying and 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 uh, icus being full etc that's when the attackers chose to be the most active um, and what this says is, is, is it tells us is that cyber crime is, is basically a sociopathic cr crime, meaning it is a crime without conscience. It doesn't care who it hurts. It doesn't care how it affects. It uses, it takes advantage of, of every weakness that it, that it sees in the environment and its sole gain it, it, or goal is to extort money um, and they know that they knew at least that during this time period that healthcare organizations would be extremely stressed the last thing that we could afford in the middle of a pandemic was to lose access to our system or our data 
Um, and this and this would be the time that we would be most inclined to pay a ransom and get out from under this risk or this threat. Um, and and it just it just shows that you know it's really funny when the pandemic first started. I remember uh, reading where somebody said you know we, cyber criminals are likely to to give us a break um, during during the pandemic. Uh, because they're not interested in, in harming anyone and just the opposite occurred. So ran the ransomware impact in, he in healthcare in 2020 was extremely um, uh, brutal. We had over 2,300 victims of significant disruption and it ranged anywhere, everywhere from federal district type organizations to academic medical centers to to standalone hospitals, to large IDNs, to, to enterprise level uh, entities, uh, and to include organizations like this, this Pennsylvania Health Services Company, which manages 400 hospitals. Um, absolutely everybody was under attack uh, on a daily basis um, during the pandemic. And what's interesting about about ransomware in, in and of itself is, and, and I alluded to this earlier, was that um, from a historical perspective, ransomware has been with us for a long time. In fact, ransomware, believe it or not, started in in healthcare. It started with AIDS researchers. Um, fortunately, the the first ransomware attack was not very sophisticated. It was on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. Um, the the decryption key was actually on the disk itself and it only encrypted the, the title not 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 the data um, but it still created a considerable amount of disruption before uh, the folks looking at it figured that out and was able to to get the uh, solution out to everybody um, but it, it basically went quiet after that for some period of time until in the early uh, 2000s when researchers, one, took the attack that occurred back in 1989 and dissected it and said, this is why it didn't work, but if you did this, it would work. And then all of a sudden we had encryption uh, come along that was more, that was allowed us to use um, uh, asymmetric uh, keys or, uh, as opposed to, to uh, symmetric keys. Um, so that all of a sudden now the, the keys could be in two different places and it reemerged again. And then in 2013, when Bitcoin uh, came on, on, the, on the stage, all of a sudden attackers had the ability to perpetrate one of these extortion attacks um, and get paid anonymously. And the chances of them getting caught went down considerably. And so all of a sudden we saw more and more ransomware attacks, as you saw in that one graph where they escalated up to where we are today, where we literally have thousands of these uh, attacks on a daily basis. So, you know, who's in your network? And this is a interesting question. You know, you know when I talked earlier about becoming more proactive, and I meant that in, in, exactly, meaning, we don't have to wait until we've been attacked or know we've been attacked to, to look and, and to determine whether or not we've been compromised. And, and this is something that's actually a very useful exercise, in my opinion, for everybody um, to do these compromise assessments, even, even if you don't know that you've been or don't think that you've been, you've been compromised because you may have been and just don't know it yet. And, and most of these attacks that, that are that are really successful and, and significantly damaging are ones where the attacker has had the ability to get into the environment and be in there for months and do reconnaissance and, and, and copy data and steal it, et cetera, et cetera, um, and actually plan their attack before they actually launch whatever the disruptive uh, component of their attack is. If you can catch them sooner, if you can identify the fact that they're there earlier before they have the ability to perhaps 
deploy all of their their tools or all of their malware, et cetera, or finish their reconnaissance or or compromise uh, all of the network, et cetera. Um, you have a fighting chance of one limiting the impact of the attack of, of their of the breach um, and and being able to respond or recover from it a lot quicker. So, you know, who's in your network and do you know? And are you testing well enough to know? Do you know if your controls are responding the way you're supposed to? One of the things that we see is that there are literally hundreds of, of security tools that we see in, in, in organizations. And we ask, you know, who's managing it? Who's administering it? Who's monitoring it? And we find out that they've got a handful of folks in some cases, some sometimes less, um, and they're not actively doing that. And they're not, and they don't know that they've been deployed successfully across, across the enterprise. And un unfortunately, those mistakes where things aren't configured properly, aren't deployed completely or, or, or across, um, um, enterprise wide, or they're not monitored, et cetera, um, end up becoming those things that the attacker, those cracks in the system, if you will, that the attacker um, takes advantage of. There's a threat intelligence report that came out uh, uh, back in February that if you haven't seen it, um, I recommend you take a look at it. This is one of the joint uh, CISA, FBI, um, uh, cyber security advisories. And this one in particular talks about what they learned from all of the attacks that occurred in 2021 across the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Um, and, and unfortunately, way too many of those attacks are still occurring as a result of phishing or uh, remote, remote uh, capabilities that are, that are uh, available or through exploiting vulnerabilities, something that's not patched, something that's obsolete, something that's not configured properly, et cetera. Um, the other thing that, that we've seen happening more often now is that you don't have to be a cyber criminal to attack someone. You just have to be able to get to a cyber criminal who's willing to do your bidding for you as a service for hire. Uh, and there's much more of that cyber, uh, cyber crime as a service uh, that's going on today. One of the things that's that's really troubling that they saw last year was that hackers are, are more actively sharing victim information. So, so one organization breaks into an organ, this an entity or a victim, uh, but then publishes that information to all the rest of the hacker community or shares it in their uh, chat rooms, et cetera. And so now all of a sudden, many different hackers know that there's that there's uh, this weakness out there that potentially can be taken advantage of. Um, they, there was a shifting away from big game hunting in the U.S. If you're not familiar with big game hunting, basically that's going after large organizations that are likely to pay bigger ransoms. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because our law enforcement organizations were more effective at hunting down uh, some of those groups like Revil, et cetera. Um, and, and we're more successful at uh, uh, taking down some of their their networks. And so basically, I think what happened was uh, the threat uh, responded to that and said, said, you know, we need to find a way to, to slide in under the radar uh, because the attacks certainly haven't, haven't stopped. Um, we're seeing a diversification in terms of how they extort uh, organizations today. They don't just encrypt the data and offer the keys back but they will copy the data and remove it and, and extort uh, for leakage. They will encrypt it and offer the key for extortion, or they will say, or they will destroy the data um, and, and extort for uh, not, destro not destroying the data. So you may actually get hit today with a cyber attack where you have literally three different chances to, to pay, the, uh, pay the ransom. Um, and, and the attacker may be sophisticated enough to be able to deploy all three of those approaches against you. Um, the other thing that was very troubling because we have a lot of organizations today that are moving more and more things out into the cloud, 
more and more things out to managed service providers. And so the threat has also gone that direction. Uh, and the threat is also going after uh, those cloud, uh, cloud providers, cloud service providers, as well as managed service providers. And oftentimes when they compromise a managed service provider, uh, they actually compromise a lot of ent entities as opposed to just one. Um, they're also attacking industrial processes in the supply chain. One of the things they figured out is I don't have to attack you directly. I just have to attack the thing that, that keeps you in operation. If I take that down, I can then, I can then extort you as well, or I can attack a data aggregator. And instead of, instead of extorting one organization, I can extort all of the organizations that that aggregator supports. Um, so they're just becoming more and more sophisticated in, in how they attack uh, and their ability to, to exploit uh, the target. Another threat intelligence report came out that was more healthcare focused. Uh, this involved the, the Conti Cyber Threat Actor Group. Um, uh, Conti has been very active in attacking organizations around the world. Uh, but in particular, the United States, um, they uh, use uh, the attack vectors of Trickball, Trickbot and Cobalt Strike, which we talked about earlier. Um, and uh, they're very adept at spear phishing campaigns and using tailored emails that contain malicious uh, attachments. Um, and basically, they do all the all the things that that you would expect, but the point is, is that this is a very sophisticated group with a very sophisticated uh, set of resources um, that is incredibly active and and very focused on on healthcare uh, as a target. Um, so if you aren't familiar, uh, you should get familiar. If you haven't read this advisory, I, I commend you to get it um, and and have your um, Folks, uh, pay attention to this. You know, I'm going to use this example because people ask, you know, when do I call? When should I call law enforcement? And the answer is yesterday. Uh, the minute you get attacked, you should call probably the first two people you should call is law enforcement and your cyber insurer. Um, you need to call your cyber insurer because you need to understand whatever their process is. Um, for ensuring that you're going to get paid, um, depending on how you uh, react or respond to the incident. But law enforcement, because, because law enforcement uh, is the one organization out there who is absolutely focused on, on, on the attacker and treating you as the victim and helping you um, get out of whatever the situation is that, um, that you unfortunately uh, find yourself in, and sometimes they have uh, they have information, or they have uh, resources, or things that they can bring to bear because of other uh, experiences that they've had that can be very very uh, helpful to you. So, so in, in this particular case, last year we saw Kaseya, which I know many of you recognize as as an organization that provides remote um, administration for. A lot of organizations, a lot of small, smaller companies, et cetera, uh, they were attacked. Uh, the compromise affected 1,500 individual companies that they supported. And the ransom note that they received initially was for $70 million, so tens of millions of dollars. Um, the good news is that the FBI actually, actually were the heroes here. Um, because they were able to find the, the, the decryption keys and solve and resolve the attack so that Kaseya, uh, one, was able to be, was able to get back up in operation and get their customers back up in operation and not have to, and didn't have to pay, pay the ransom. So, you know, you, you hear all kinds of stories. My point to you is don't be hesitant about calling law enforcement. They're there to help. They've got the resources in many instances to do that. Um, and they're very focused on, on helping you with this situation. So what are some of the top uh, vulnerabilities that, that we saw last year 
as an organization in the hundreds of, of uh, assessments and, and thousands of, of uh, tests that we run uh, across the industry and across the country. Um, and those, those were things that involved informal supply chain risk management practices. Not everybody is really focused on understanding the risk that their vendors um, uh, present to them. Uh, network segmentation had, continues to be uh, um, a, a challenge, um, and it's something that can be partially solved by other other solutions like uh, EDR. Um, but organizations that don't have good network segmentation and don't have EDR and aren't being monitored, uh, it just greatly in, in increases the risk that a, that an attack is is going to be able to exploit their environment very quickly. Um, lack of IR or incident response runbooks or lack of validating or testing of current um, it, uh, incident response uh, plans. Um, we still don't see a lot of organizations actually stressing their plan, meaning going beyond the, the simple tabletop and doing an immersive exercise, if you will, where they where they create an, uh, an, uh, an uh, a, an environment where people have to problem solve um, and actually really get down in the weeds in terms of understanding what their response responsibilities are and what the whole organization needs to do, not just the IT folks. Incomplete use of multi-factor authentication for privileged users. Either implement a privileged access uh, management solution or make sure that you have MFA on all of your privileged accounts. That privileged account in the hands of an attacker is, is the one thing that enables them to eat, to exploit you the easiest and in the most damaging way. Take that away from them. Lack of awareness of all network connected assets. Do you even know how many devices are connected to your network? Do you even know where all of them are? The use of stale or weak passwords. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, again, if we're using MFA, all of a sudden passwords don't become as much of an issue. But the fact of the matter is that we need to, we need to stop reusing passwords. We need to make sure that people aren't using their corporate password on, on DSW to buy shoes or, or some other network, because those are the networks that, that are more likely to get compromised. And when they do, now you have those credentials that are out there on the dark web for sale um, and they shouldn't be out there in the first place. Um, missing patches. I, I, I don't even know how to, dis how to discuss missing patches. I mean, we know patching is an important thing to do. Uh, there should never be a, a situation where a critical vulnerability or a serious vulnerability goes unpatched for any length of time. And yet we see in, in scans where uh, organizations have very definitive rules with respect to when things get patched and they don't follow them. And I can only, only surmise that the reason we don't is because either we're too busy doing other things, we don't have the resources, or we're just, we just don't have good discipline around our administrative management of the environment. Um, the use of default installations with no security hardening. <laughs> um, it sounds today and day, today's day and age, you might not think that that happens, but unfortunately it does. Things get taken out of the box, plugged into the network, and nobody ever pays attention to whether it was hardened uh, before it was turned on. And then last but not least, secure, lack of secure coding practices. Um, you know, most organizations don't do uh, their own coding, uh, but where, the, where we see this the most it is in uh, some homegrown applications. We see it in APIs. And the fact of the matter is you can, you, if you, even if you don't know how to code securely, you can have those things tested. Um, and you should, absolutely should, should test anything that you're going to deploy in your environment, whether you developed it or, or whether you have somebody in external develop it. So let me stop there and Lauren, see if there are any questions about the last section. Yes, we've got some great questions. Just confirming you can hear me, Mac. I can hear. Okay, so the first one, 
Do you think that healthcare attack slash breach numbers are skewed higher relative to other industries because of reporting requirements? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, many, many other industries, as I said at, at, the, at the top of the hour, um, don't have, have a reporting requirement. And I guarantee you they're having breaches. Um, and, uh, but for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is they're afraid it'll hurt their business or affect them uh, negatively in some manner. Uh, if they don't have a requirement to report, they don't report. Um, and unfortunately, that means that other organizations or other people may be victim uh, as well by virtue of the fact that the primary organization that was compromised uh, never tells anybody that that occurred. Okay, thank you for that question and answer. Another question in regards to insurance. With the recent jump in insurance payouts, what new requirements are being leveled on healthcare entities? So I'm actually going to cover that in another section in detail. Okay. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to I'm going to save the answer to that question. Uh, but it's a great question, and there are some, absolutely some some very specific things that that uh, cyber insurance carriers are requesting organizations do. Okay, last question for this segment. We have an audience member who would like your thoughts, Mac, on the use of IoT devices within hospitals and healthcare providers. What action do you recommend to healthcare providers in securing these devices? So, um, you know, first of all, you can't get away from using uh, IoT devices. Um, and there are some IoT devices, frankly, that actually improve what we do and are a benefit um, to our business. So we don't want to uh, um, just not use them um, across the board. I think what, where, where I come down on it is just like any other, any other thing that we use today in a, in a networked environment, and that is I'd want to make sure that I was using uh, technology that was vetted uh, that had some level of, of, of um, documentable uh, security uh, evaluation with respect to how it was designed that had the features and functions that I need to be able to secure it properly so that it doesn't become a, um, an attack vector uh, for, for my environment. I would want to make sure that I had a deployment uh, methodology that, that uh, recognized the different types of IoT devices. Uh, some IoT devices are are important. Some IoT devices are are less important or not directly related to the mission. Um, I would want to make sure that I had those segmented on on the network. Um, I would want to make sure that I knew where all those devices were and could manage their location and what they communicated with. Um, such that a device could not uh, uh, communicate with parts of the network or, or other assets on the network that, that it did not need to uh, or, or shouldn't. Um, and I would want to be able to monitor those, those devices on an ongoing basis uh, with respect to um, their, uh, their life cycle in terms of, of um, when issues arise with respect to them as they get older, uh, et cetera. Um, and and uh, I would want to have very definite procedures around uh, any of those devices that, for instance, uh, retained data or retained information and what happens to that information when that device is removed um, um, from the network. And the, and the good news is, is that we now have tools that enable us to not only find all of those IoT devices on our network and map them in terms of where they're at, where they live, what their IP address is, what they're what they're capable of communicating with, but we, but some of those tools actually even allow us to simulate the risk associated with that device depending on the location on the network or where where we actually place it so that we can actually identify the least um, 
risky is for a lack of a better term, uh, the, the least risky location to actually deploy that device or the most advantageous, advantageous uh, location for that device. Um, and we need to take advantage of those, of those tools. Um, and uh, because we have literally thousands of devices on, on our networks today, and in fact, in fact, many, many, or, or at least some percentage of the breaches that we experience or issues that we experience are indeed coming through these devices or, or devices that we least expect um, that we're not thinking about, uh, frankly, uh, because they're just not um, uh, the main thing that we're we're dealing with on the network. But they're absolutely uh, they absolutely um, contribute to our risk profile. All right, that is all the questions for now. All right, well, let's shift gears and, and talk about privacy for a second and talk about some of the enforcement that's, that's, uh, that we're seeing and, uh, and how that's playing out. So if you look at the, the summary of privacy regulations by country around the world, um, you notice that we are not necessarily the most protected um, around the country. In fact, we fall in the minimal uh, protection category. There are other countries that have far greater um, privacy protections uh, than we do. Um, um, and, uh, but, and there are some, some uh, locations that have uh, effectively none or no uh, protections whatsoever. Um, so uh, we don't, so this is kind of sort of, if you ever wondered how we kind of measure up, uh, this is how we kind of measure up. And, uh, but, but, the, the, but the green on this map, and I'm told that if you look back, uh, it's actually getting darker green uh, all the time, which means more and more uh, privacy regulations are being written uh, and implemented uh, across the planet. But how does that affect us here in the States? Um, and, and there is very specific uh, legislation that has occurred here, like the 21st Century Cures Act, um, the proposed changes to the HIPAA privacy rule in terms of right, right of access, uh, et cetera. In fact, right of access is a, is a, a fairly uh, big issue. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in a minute. And it's one area that uh, OCR has been, has been uh, uh, increasingly more active in terms of enforcement. Um, and the fines have actually increased um, uh, over, over time. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, when you just look at the, the state laws, uh, as well, we have, you know, 50 different breach notification laws across the country. We have, uh, uh, several, uh, laws that have been passed by organizations that are, that are, um, uh, more restrictive, if you will, or, 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 or um, more protective, uh, and we have others that are currently in in being uh, are in the process, uh, like Utah, Oklahoma, Iowa, and Maryland, uh, which may come out uh, before too long. Bottom line is, privacy laws are conti are continuing to evolve uh, and become more and more protective uh, as time goes on. Um, this kind of shows you the 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 uh, from an um, OCR perspective, uh, the incidents that get reported to them and how and how this has uh, evolved over time. Uh, if you look at it from the beginning to March of last year, um, you notice that there was a much larger uh, component of breach that that fell into the theft and loss uh, categories and, un and unauthorized disclosure. Uh, and only about 40% of our, our loss uh, was in, in the hacking uh, and IT se segment. And when all of a sudden you go from, from there to where we, um, uh, through um, um, the next um, uh, quarter, if you will, uh, of 2021, you notice that hacking was the majority of the incidents that we've saw that we saw 
And then the next largest uh, category was unauthorized access or disclosure. Um, the threat posture or picture, if you will, for healthcare as it relates to, to how we're losing information um, has changed demonstrably uh, since 2009 when we started essentially, if, if you recall, 2009 was when the High Tech Act came out and everybody had to have an EHR. Uh, and today, everybody pretty much has an EHR, and and nearly 98% of our data is digitized today. So instead of losing data through theft uh, or through records or through uh, those kinds of, of, of means, it's, make, it's logical that the way we lose most of our data today is through hacking, and that's exactly what the data shows. Um, when you look at the enforcement uh, highlights, if you will, if you, if you want to call them that. Um, the number number of settlements is has stayed pretty constant. The last two years, uh, 2020 and 2021, have actually been have actually been higher, uh, which means that OCR was still very active even during uh, the pandemic. Um, the uh, the average civil monetary penalty has actually gone up. Uh, it's close to uh, $2 million today. Um, if you look at the graph to the right, um, the thing that's important here is that when you look at these, uh, uh, look at these things, um, if you are required to have a monitor, then uh, as a result of a, of a uh, resolution agreement, then your cost associated with that corrective action plan goes up significantly. Um, if you just receive a corrective action plan, um, then uh, the cost is very manageable with respect to your activity and the things perhaps that you have to do to respond. But if you have to have a, have a monitor, whether it's internal, external, or both, um, that means you, there, are, there are additional record, reporting requirements um, and additional costs associated with those monitors. So, Anytime you get into a situation with, with OCR around a breach, you want to work um, cooperatively with them uh, to the point that, that they don't end up believing uh, as they go through that, that you need somebody or to monitor uh, your uh, response or your uh, fulfillment of that corrective action plan. At, at worst, you want to come out with just a corrective action plan is, is where, what I'm getting to. Um, I talked about, I told you I'd talk about right of access initiative because I'm told by my uh, privacy folks that this is something that, that is a big issue today. Um, there were 20 enforcement actions since September of 2019, which I think is pretty significant. Uh, there's a couple of them here that you can look at and you can see the actual fines that were levied. In one case, it was in the millions. In the other case, it was in the tens of thousands. Um, but what's interesting is that when we looked across, when we looked at this and then we looked across all of the privacy program assessments um, that we perform each year, we noticed that over 50% of the organizations that we assessed um, had gaps or challenges around individual right of access. So this is obviously something that, that people are either struggling with or don't understand or are, are, or are challenged with. Um, and, un and unfortunately, it's, it, it's something that OCR um, has decided to um, take up as, a, as an issue that needs to be uh, dealt with. Some of the top issues also identified uh, by our privacy assessments outside of a right of access, um, uh, no or limited user access monitoring and auditing, uh, uh, defective uh, HIPAA authorizations, violations of minimal necessary rule, insufficient policies and procedures, and no or inappropriate hybrid entity uh, designation. And if you're not familiar with the hybrid entity uh, concept, if you're an organization that, that only part of your organization provides covered 
uh, activity as it relates to healthcare, uh, you can literally define those parts of your entity that are that are considered part of the hybrid entity that are covered under HIPAA and other parts that are not. Um, if you don't have that well defined, then essentially your entire environment uh, becomes susceptible to uh, oversight, if you will. And so you want to do a good job of that uh, if you are in that category. This applies a lot in many respects to academic medical centers because typically they have a hospital, they have a medical school, they may have a dental school or some other school of medicine uh, in, at, at the university that or clinics that are that are designated as part of the hybrid entity, but then they have other other colleges uh, at the university who are definitely not part of healthcare and don't provide covered activity and you don't want them inspectable. Uh, under a under a HIPAA scenario, so designating that hybrid entity correctly is is a, a very important and, and useful uh, thing to do. Um, the how to address is is provided here for each and every one of these, um, but these are things that when I talked about the annual uh, conference that we have for our customers each year, you know, one of the things that will happen is we'll have a panel, for instance, on on the results of our privacy assessments in the air challenge areas and how to address those uh, so that people can discuss that and share information with respect to how they do it, uh, which is very usually very useful. Um, but uh, these are the areas that typically are most often uh, identified. So let me stop there and see if there's any questions on privacy. There are no questions yet. If you have questions on privacy, please feel free to upload them in the Q&A function. Okay, well then let's move on to the supply chain. So when we talk about supply chain, we're talking about all of those different entities that provide us support that aren't necessarily part of our organization. So think, think of it as your vendors uh, that you do business with that maybe provide some IT service or support or data service or support, or it could be a cloud vendor or an ISP, if you will. Uh, but but uh, there are more and more, more and more of our environment is, is finding its way into uh, those other, um, those other locations. Uh, to the point that, as I said, as you heard me say earlier, there's 30 to 40 percent of our IT and data systems and services that are now provided by external entities. Um, when you look at the, the studies that are out there, and we see this all the time and we hear it all the time, uh, organizations, uh, um, 51 percent have experienced a data breach caused by a third party. Uh, somebody who is doing something for them, has their data, has, has some uh, system of theirs, etc. cetera. Um, and, and we expect that in 2022, that number is going to go up to, to 60% uh, just because of the, the growth and the number of, of vendors that organizations have. And I saw another statistic not too long ago, and I couldn't find it again, and I was just kind of flabbergasted by it, but it was talking about literally the number of vendors that are the number of list of vendors that are growing for for our institutions is 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 almost like 2000 um and i'm thinking that is a, that is a very large number of, of uh, vendors for for organizations to have to try to manage um these are some examples of third parties if you will or other organizations that have suffered a, a breach uh, of some type and and or an attack that has affected healthcare. And the first one there you see WannaCry. WannaCry is the actual attack itself that went after Windows NT. In this particular case, um, you had a lot of organizations when this came out in 2017 who were still running Windows NT, believe it or not. 
Uh, one of those organizations was the UK Health System, which is a national uh, health system. And when they got hit with WannaCry, it pretty much took down the entire uh, health system for all of the United Kingdom. Um, this affected a lot of organizations. It affected a lot of organizations in America. When this thing was released uh, on the internet, uh, within 24 hours, there were literally thousands of organizations that were hit with WannaCry in over 150 uh, uh, countries around the planet. Um, and, and that's one of the things that's, that we're really worried about with this situation that's going on overseas right now, because, because all too often when these cyber attacks occur or these um, uh, mal this malware is released on the internet, even though it may be directed at somebody in particular, um, it typically spreads way wider than the intended target. And the reason for that, frankly, is because we are now so interconnected. So if I attack you, I, I could potentially be attacking you and many of the folks that you're connected to. Uh, and so um, these things tend to spread very rapidly, especially if they're a zero day attack, like we saw with the log4j uh, shell attacks. Um, and they if then they can they have the ability to affect a lot of people, you know, log for for J shell, which is a which is a library attack um, that's used very uh, frequently for app web applications that that uh, utilize uh, Java code. Um, you know, it was found in literally thousands of systems, and when it when it came out, it was a zero day attack, um, and and it basically spread spread very quickly. Um, all of you probably lived through that because it just occurred here not too long ago in December. And all of you know that you went through literally four different patching, uh, patching exercises to address the log4j shell attack, which meant that for a solid month, many of our organizations had to stop whatever they were doing or had some people who had to stop whatever they were doing to apply those patches um, in order to not be susceptible to this. And it wasn't just the systems that we had in our environment, it was our vendors as well um, that we had to be um, concerned about. So this was, even though it necessarily didn't lead to a tremendous number of major breaches or attacks, if you will, um, it was a very disruptive uh, event in, in the sense of, of diverting resources to having to address this as opposed to doing other things. We talked about the Kaseya attack that occurred last year. Um, in this particular case, it compromised one of their MSPs, which then compromised uh, as many as 1,500 uh, entities. Um, it was another zero day, day attack, but in this case, the FBI was able to come through uh, and get them out of this, uh, this mess. But this could have been potentially a huge, huge issue had that not, uh, had we not had that, that good luck, if you will, or good fortune uh, to be able to have that information. Colonial Pipeline, I know all of you know that this is one of the largest critical infrastructure attacks that we've seen in, in our country. Uh, disrupted the fuel, distribution of fuel up and down the eastern seaboard, affected the pricing of price of fuel, et cetera. Um, and, and really what you're dealing with here is all the interdependencies of anybody who needs fuel for anything that they do. Um, and, 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 you know, in terms of trucks that deliver goods, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it was just a very uh, disruptive uh, uh, attack. And then we have Kronos. Kronos cloud-based service provides a timekeeping solution that many of our health systems use and thousands of organizations use around, around the globe. In this particular case, the, the attackers attack the infrastructure between the Kronos um, production environment and their three uh, data centers, which essentially made their data un, un, uh, unavailable. Uh, to them, it was a classic disruption attack, um, and it absolutely shut down uh, all of their customers who, who relied on their system, which was a cloud-based solution, 
uh, for timekeeping. And a lot of, and we today have several organizations uh, around the country who are being sued by uh, hourly workers who uh, are unhappy or disgruntled because they didn't get paid on time or when they should have uh, because organizations didn't have have uh, good backups for if they ever lost this this support and this is a good example of of where you cannot put things whether it's a whether it's a solution a service a database you name it you cannot put those things in the cloud and not plan for the eventuality that 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 they're going to not be available to you you have to treat your attack surface and your environment as that extended environment if you're going to put a critical system or a critical set of data in, in a cloud structure somewhere or some service somewhere uh, or at some vendor you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at disaster recovery and business continuity uh, because if you don't you run the risk of, of what happened to a lot of organizations when Kronos all of a sudden wasn't there and they were five days away from a payday, a week away from Christmas. So I'm going to go through a, a little bit of a scenario here. This is an actual uh, case, uh, something that that uh, I worked on uh, back uh, in the early part of 2000. Um, this was an organization, I would have never thought that juice came from New York, <laughs> uh, or other than apple juice. Um, but literally, there's a facility in in Western New York, which is one of the largest juice manufacturers in the country, and they actually produce the juice that is whether it's some you know some variety that you think comes from Florida or California or whatever, it actually doesn't. It comes from them, and and the formulas for all those juices they, they hold those formulas for the companies that they produce the juice for, as well as the packaging and the labeling, et cetera, et cetera. And they literally produce it and then ship it to those organizations, distribution centers, or to um, uh, food distribution centers, et cetera. This organization actually got a contract in the early 2000s with Walmart, and Walmart had some pretty serious requirements for them with respect to uh, continuity in terms of their internet connection as well as their plant and it was all tied to the fees and the penalties that they would be assessed if they failed to provide the juice in the in the volume that they needed to produce it and to, and to the distribution centers for Walmart in a, in a timely fashion and so this was a huge business risk for them and they needed they needed to address it. So we, we were asked to consult uh, with them. I say we, it was me before Synergistic, but we were, I was asked to consult to help them address their, um, the continuity of their environment as it related from an internet connectivity perspective for the order taking uh, piece of it, which we were, we ended up having to bring in redundant lines and redundant uh, infrastructure, if you will, at the perimeter. Um, but the other thing that we did was we had the production piece of it and we said okay well, what's in you know what is what could disrupt this business or this your ability to produce and to ship and and it was absolutely the technology because the entire place looked like a um a, a refinery with all of these bladders uh that were scattered all over acres and acres of land with thousands and thousands maybe more than thousands of miles of pipe that all came back to a central uh, uh, command center, if you will, where software actually drove the formulation of the juices and the production and, the, and then the packaging, et cetera, et cetera. And it was all automated. Um, so if the technology went down, they went down. Um, and the Achilles heel to the technology was the power. Um, the the um, the ability to keep the technology up or to replace things in, in fairly rapid fashion was, was there. But the one thing that couldn't be replicated easily was power. And so we looked at the power, we looked at where they got their power in terms of the power grids, 
we looked at their backup with respect to the power if the power grid went down and we recognized that that the generator that they had wasn't large enough to run the plant number one actually you needed more than one generator number two the fuel that the generator needed was probably the biggest challenge because there wasn't enough fuel for it to to, to power it for uh, an extended period of time so we actually took um additional bladders if you will um tanks and and brought more fuel in than 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 normal to be able to to achieve a certain time period that that the uh generators could operate because one of the things that we figured out was that if they went down and if a whole bunch of other people went down around them there weren't enough fuel trucks and fuel to actually come save them because the fuel was primarily going to go first to hospitals then to the emergency responders fire departments etc they were way down the list of people who were going to get fuel so we actually built that out they installed it all they finished it but at, in the fall of 2002 and in 2003 new york had a brownout and most of the western part of new york went down lost power and this organization never stopped producing juice never missed a step um and it was because it had the redundancy it needed it had the power that it needed and the fuel that it needed to drive that power because it had done the analysis to understand what was critical to the business and a lot of times what's critical to the business is not what you think or what you see or, or, or think about every day, but it's something else that it's dependent on. You have to follow those dependencies all the way down to the lowest one to make sure that you covered the thing that could potentially take you down um, if it disappears or, or is disrupted without ever affecting you directly. So what are some of the vendor uh, security management trends that we see in, in, in the vendor uh, supply chain assessments that we perform for hospitals? Well, access control is a big one. And that's, you know, that's a huge one in terms of, of uh, you know, what does your vendor have access to that perhaps they shouldn't. Um, systems and service acquisition, services acquisition, program management, uh, systems and communication, protections and, and last but not least incident response because we have seen multiple cases where vendors third service providers have gone down or had an incident and have performed very poorly or have not responded or have not alerted um, the organization that they're supporting and, and oftentimes there's an impact to them um, that could have been avoided had 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 there been better, uh, had they worked together to identify that, you know, in the event of an, in the event of something happening, here's what we need to do together. Um, so it's something we really do need to pay attention to. All right, let me stop there and see if there's any supply chain questions. No questions at this time, Mac. Okay, then I'm going to go into the audit part. And this is a part that a lot of, a lot of people don't really think about that much. Um, but I would, I would argue that, that all too often we leave audit to the audit department and we don't, we don't think about audit as an asset to security or to privacy. And we should. And the reason I say that is because some of the things that we need to test in security or in, in privacy are not things that I can test technically, right? Um, they're, not a, they're not a technical controls issue, or even if they are, it's something that I have to look at the configuration as opposed to whether or not the control is, is enabled uh, or, or what have you. Um, and, and or it's the process that I need to, to evaluate as opposed to the, the actual thing. So think, vulnerability management there are five different pieces of vulnerability management technical testing scanning etc is just one of those right um, which has a real technical component to it 
but what about all the other parts and, 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 and are we following it? You know, things like provisioning, right? You may even have provisioning uh, automated, but in general, there's going to be some systems that we can't automate in that in that process and that are going to have to be manually uh, provisioned or deprovisioned, et cetera. And and but and so where audit uh, plays um, a role um, is in allowing us to actually lay, layer on another layer of reviewing how well our processes are working and not just our not just our technical controls but we can also use some of our technical evaluations to augment our auditing uh, process for instance so so when you think about it you think of when we think of when we, we talk about things like security controls validation which is basically using a, a tool that allows us to simulate a a uh, a hack, if you will, or a cyber attack in an environment that then tests the various controls. For instance, did IDS see it? Did it report on it? Did it alert? Did endpoint protection see it? And did it did it alert? Did the firewall uh, um, see it and, and and alert on it? Did did the did the organization that's providing uh, SOC services to us? For instance, did they see all of these various alerts and reports and did they alert somebody? So you can actually evaluate, you can actually think of audit as, as a way to use both technical testing as well as uh, process review to evaluate how well your security is performing and get more proactive in identifying where things are that I need to address. Um, business business continuity is a classic example where audit is very very beneficial to us right so we can use audit to enhance um, security because we can look at all these processes that are so important that have to function just as well as the controls that are used within those processes same thing um, again, you know, how, how do you, how do you, you do this? This is just one example in, in terms of, of ac uh, user access to identify users with segregation of duties that can bypass a control process. Very important to understand in some cases, right? Change management, et cetera, all of these things. Okay. Same thing uh, applies on the privacy side. Right, so it's it's taking audit and and in thinking about it as just another one of our evaluative tools in security or privacy. So you can do one of two things: you can you can develop your own audit program and plan, or you can work with your internal audit organization um, and and. And, and develop one together. Oftentimes, a lot of our internal audit organizations don't have an IT auditor. They don't have a technical auditor. So this is a way where you can work together and provide them a capability that they need as well and don't have that that you can you can you can provide. Any questions on on how how to use audit more effectively? No audit questions, Mac. Okay. So let's talk about uh, what I call ensuring resilience, which is, which is um, my uh, graduating from simple tabletops in our uh, DR and, and business continuity um, preparations to more immersive type uh, exercises. Um, you know, continuity plans matter. And unfortunately, when you look at the, the breaches that have occurred, the disruption, the disruptive attacks that occur, it's the downtime and the business part pieces and parts of this that are affected that are far more costly than the actual event itself. Um, 
and you can see from the slide here in terms of in terms of the magnitude of what we're talking about when you look at things like the Scripps uh, um, event that occurred uh, last year, right? 113 million is what they estimated the cost to be. Most of that was in business lost and downtime uh, expense, not just not specifically the incident itself, um, and that's typically the case. Um, there was a hospital on the East Coast, for instance, that went down and, and the CFO there did something really unique. He actually tracked the financial impact of, of the breach throughout the life of, 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 uh, of the breach and beyond to, to identify where they were before the breach financially, where they were at their lowest point during the breach financially, and then how long it took them to just get back to where they were prior to the breach, meaning they still lost money with respect to cost of the breach and opportunity loss cost, but just to get back to where they were. And it took more than 13 months to do that. So these, these breaches that last two weeks, three weeks, what have you, they have very long tails associated with them and, and very high costs that go well beyond the actual breach itself. So what is an immersive exercise? What am I talking about, right? We all know what a tabletop is and tabletops allow you to, to describe your checklist and, and look over your recall rosters and, and review roles and responsibilities and kind of sort of talk through a scenario and your plan, et cetera. But they don't really cause you to problem solve. They don't really take you deep into a scenario where things don't necessarily go according to plan uh, or individuals that you that are supposed to be there all of a sudden are not there because they're on vacation somewhere or, or, or something else. So so immersive exercises are a deeper dive into a simulated experience. They um, they typically simulate a more complex a scenario with more problem injects and they put the organizations basically in a stressful situation and and they're built around bringing taking those key stakeholders and and then giving them problems to solve that aren't necessarily in 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 keeping with whatever they thought their their uh the steps were that they were going to follow right and and there are scenarios that cause the players to have to do something. They have to interact with somebody else. They have to develop a communication. They have to go solve a problem. They have to to um, collaborate on 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 uh, um, a response right to something or decide are they going to pay the ransom or not? Uh, should they pay the ransom in this case? Um, Etc. Um, so more, more, a more granular approach, um, a more stressful approach, um, a more problem solving approach so that when we come out of it, people actually understand what they need to do better and they have a better sense for what it could potentially be like. Um, and, and we find the gaps in the plan that we wouldn't have found with a simple tabletop. Okay. You know, so what's that process? Well, the first thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that the event or the exercise or the scenario that is simulated is one that is consistent with, with healthcare and with care delivery, right? The second thing we want to do is we want to then take that and tailor it to your particular environment because not all hospitals or health systems um, or uh, business associates for that matter are the same. Uh, they, may, they may be very different, running different EMRs, other different services, part of them is in the cloud, part of them is on-prem, maybe all of them is in the cloud, et cetera. So what is your environment and how do I take this scenario? And then, and then tailor it specifically to you and to, the, and to the challenges that you might have 
and then develop that scenario and put you into that exercise where all of the key stakeholders um, in, in, in under very short timelines have to start problem solving and have to work together and have to demonstrate not only that they can read the plan, but that they understand the plan and then can extrapolate from the plan to how do you address this particular issue? And then last but not least, um, create an environment where there's a lot of communication around this so that everybody in the process is learning. Um, and it comes out of it with a much better appreciation and understanding of what incident response is all about. Some of the lessons learned from running immersive exercises with hospitals, uh, um, you know, don't panic. <laughs> do not uh, do not engage with with the attacker, uh, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but when they get that message and it and it invites them to that chat room um, to begin uh, to, to to talk to the attacker. But the minute you do that, you, you start the clock ticking. So the last thing you want to do is start that communication before you're ready to have that communication, right? Don't shut things down. You start shutting things down, turning things off. You can cause all kinds of problems with your files to the point that you may not be able to get them back. Uh, oftentimes, um, the uh, software or the uh, malware that the attacker uses is 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 not the not the uh, the best in the world and and so shutting things down turning things off deleting things can can actually harm you more than than you think right um we talked about engaging legal quickly pr support incident response contact your insurance um you know bringing in somebody who knows what they're doing notifying law enforcement these are all lessons learned that from the different immersive exercises that have, that have come out of that, that people just weren't prepared to do or didn't really, hadn't really thought through these things at the level of granularity uh, that they needed to. Um, and, you know, I talked about wanting to make sure that you had law enforcement involved and you had somebody who knows what they're doing um, supporting you in this process. This is a classic example of, a, of why that's important. This is a threat advisory that came out with respect to a group called Avos Locker, uh, which is a ransomware as a service uh, group. Uh, so it's one of these groups that others can hire to actually uh, attack. Um, they have come after critical infrastructure in the United States. Um, and uh, so that's very important uh, to understand that this is a group that not only exists, but is very active and very uh, good at what they do. Um, and they're the guys that, that run, basically orchestrate these attacks and then, and then manage the process to include things like the ransom negotiations. Um, what's really important here is that, is that you don't engage with somebody like this until you're absolutely ready to engage with them, that you have somebody who understands how to negotiate with these guys effectively because, uh, because you can negotiate the ransom. And in fact, you should. Um, but you need to understand how to do that, how to communicate with them. Oftentimes, they're going to they're gonna be speaking in a foreign language. Um, you need to be able to speak in that language and understand the, the, the tonation of the of the um, discussion um, so that whatever you say comes across the way you want it to come across. Um, professional uh, organizations that do this kind of work um, um, know all those different things and those different pitfalls, if you will, or potholes to, to avoid. Uh, when dealing with groups like Atlas Locker. This is a very professional group. If you haven't done, haven't had to deal with ransomware a lot or, or extortion a lot, then I think it's pretty obvious you need to make sure you've got somebody on your team who has 
to help coach you through that or to actually handle that process. How is, you know, one of the other issues that we see on the, on the IR side is, is the aspect of where does insurance play in this? Um, the fact of the matter is that insurance is very rapidly changing uh, how they uh, play into this and, the, and, and a lot of that's being driven by the, the number of breaches and the severity of the breaches, which has absolutely changed uh, how the cyber insurance companies uh, approach this. Um, a lot of them are now providing less coverage. They're more restrictive in their covenants or in their underwriting requirements. Um, they don't cover, they never have covered the whole incident and don't. So a lot of times a catastrophic event, um, they won't cover any more than a fraction of it. Um, and, and for the most part, they're there to cover that three to five million dollar event, if you will. Um, and this is why. These are the kind of payouts that insurance organizations are seeing um, and having to, to contend with. And because of it, like I said, you're seeing less coverage, more underwriting, more requirements, smaller payouts, higher premiums. What are some of the things that, that we're seeing cyber insurance organizations uh, require uh, healthcare entities to have or to demonstrate before they uh, can be can be covered or before they uh, or that affect their premiums frameworks do you have a framework for how you implemented your security um, do you implement email gateways if you're running office 365 do you have advanced the advanced security uh, features enabled on that uh, application uh, multi-factor authentication on on uh, public facing applications on email accounts etc uh, pam privileged access management are you do you literally have privileged access access accesses um, on your network or or have you eliminated them eliminated them through the use of pam edr endpoint detection phishing training a good solid approach to backups think think some of the other organizations that have been hit a lot of these attacks actually if they're able to get in and to be there long enough to do their reconnaissance a lot of times they'll hit your backups before they hit your production environment so when you go down you're down and if you don't have another copy of your data that's not on the network somewhere then you're out of luck right so remember the old simple rule right three two one three sources, two back, two data, data centers or, or backup locations, and one copy off the network. Um, and it's that copy off the network that, that saves, saves us when all the rest of it is encrypted. Okay. Any questions on, on IR or the insurance? And, and did I answer the, the individual's question on the insurance? No questions, Mac, um, but we are over on time by four minutes. Okay, so, so let's wrap up really quickly then. Okay, so the whole point in all this obviously was to provide information to help, to help raise your awareness um, about what's going on with respect to cyber and privacy in, in healthcare. Um, the thing that I, I, would, I would like you to take away from all of this is that as the threat evolves, we must, have, we must evolve as well, that doing what we did in the past is not gonna, is not gonna cut it. We need to change what we do. Um, and, and we need to change our mindset if we expect to get a new set of results. We need to focus more on, on risk, not compliance, uh, not, and stop comparing grades. Oftentimes the grade you get on an assessment has no bearing on the grade that your neighbor got anyway. Uh, because it's based on a totally different set of, of nuances. So quit worrying about whether you're a 3.2 and your neighbor's a 3.4. Um, increase cyber skills, knowledge of all IT staff, and embrace uh, partners. There aren't enough resources to go around for any of us to do it alone. We have to work together. 
And we have to recognize that anybody that touches a system needs to have at least a basic understanding of, of cyber as it relates to that system. Understand the threat to the extent that you can. Increase your environmental awareness in terms of what does the threat know about me and know your attack surface. Know where you're susceptible and where your data is. Understand the difference between reactive and proactive defense um, and lean towards being proactive. Adopt continuous monitoring, right? Testing, compromise analysis, controls validation, active monitoring in terms of watching what's going on. If we're not doing that, we're not going to be able to anticipate the threat. Develop advanced organizational muscle memory to enhance readiness. Tabletops to learn the process, immersive exercises to test the process and to help organizations actually um, get good at reacting. And then last but not least, share information with each other. Take field trips, go see what, you're, what other folks are doing. There's, you know, one thing interesting about privacy and security is you can share what you're doing. It's not, it's not a competitive edge. In fact, in fact, it's more of a competitive edge if all of us are stronger and more secure than if, it, than if there's a weak partner out there somewhere. Because nine times out of 10, that other entity that's located near you is probably connected to some of the same people that you are. So this is not something that, that, that this is not the latest and greatest technique for how to do brain surgery or how to, how to, how to replace a knee. This is something that we all should work together on and we should share because the stronger we all are as a group, the more competitive we're all going to be individually. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for attending. I apologize for, for going over a bit. Uh, obviously, we'll have to do a little bit better uh, with, the, on that, uh, with respect to that next time. One of the things that I would ask each and every one of you uh, to do for me is think about what you heard today. Think about what you'd like to hear that you didn't hear. Uh, and think about topics that you'd like us to include. Uh, because as we develop this along the way, we, we want it to be dynamic and we want it to be interactive if we can. Um, and we want to be able to have it include the things that you're interested in. So thank you very much and, and please give us your feedback. All right. Thank you, Mac. And thank you, viewers. Don't forget to check back with us on April 14th for our next briefing.